Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so we will start just in one minute or so. And this event will be recorded just for your information. And it will be posted in Hello Tomorrow website and YouTube account, if that's OK with everyone. Um, just to remind all of you, you are all allowed to speak. You just uh, please stay muted. Stay muted um, when you are not speaking to to be polite with the rest of the participants, and that's it. Um, Noah, maybe you can um, introduce yourself and start this event. Yes, that would be amazing. Um, let me turn on my camera as well. Sorry that uh, everyone is not seeing me yet. Hope the technology now works. Was Okay, interesting as you're not seeing me. Let me try to fix this. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to our friends and also good morning to whoever joined in the States. Uh, and hopefully it's not too late on your side or too early. Uh, I'm Noah and I work for the innovation team uh, at OPPO. I'm actually based in Tel Aviv in Israel. So for many of you who have been here, uh, you're more than welcome to find us here on the ground. We have a lovely team of three full-time employees, even though we're a 40,000 people company globally. Uh, we will have someone on the uh, line later today to introduce a little bit about what we do, uh, what OPPO is about, and uh, what we like to achieve with this project and uh, you know all the other good things that's gonna happen. Uh, I would definitely also like to use this opportunity to thank everyone for being in here. Uh, you know, of course, for all the contestants that fill in all the application forms, submit your proposal. Uh, every single proposal is uh, was sorry very well received and analyzed and evaluated by our expertise, uh, both in house and both at uh, the uh, the I would say the Hello Tomorrow partner and other partners as well, including Zero Project. Um, Maybe that we can start with the first slide of the presentation, Alba, please. And uh, I don't know why my camera is not on. <laughs> yes, so that's me, uh, in case you want to see how do I look like. This is me on a good day. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. And thank you so much for everyone who has been with us, uh, you know, in the past, starting from May, because this is when the project first kicked off. Uh, I'm very happy to let you know that we are already approaching the end of the regional phase of the first OPPO's Research Institute uh, acceleration program. And also, you know, before we really start to accelerate anyone, we're in the process of selecting 
uh, those winners from each region and also from the headquarter in China uh, to go to the next stage. Uh, so a little bit reminder, if you don't know why you're here today, hopefully not, uh, we at OPPO are always striving to serve our consumers, which is 400 million users globally. And we're always you know, striving for tech for good. And this year that we have this initiative where we want to you know, look for the best tax expert, startups, initiatives, or any solution you can propose to help to solve the most concerning accessibility and digital health issues. And uh, now we are already at the second session of the pitching competition. We had one last week in Tel Aviv. That was a offline uh, plus online hybrid event. And today is going to be online fully. And then for our next step, it's going to be in the beginning of the August, we're going to have a pre-demo day. And then uh, you're going to meet other contestants there. There's going to be around 40 of them. And for the final, final demo day, which is scheduled at the end of August, uh, there's going to be 15 contestants from all over the world and competing for the final winning uh, results or final winning positions. Um, I don't want to repeat the uh, prizes again today. You can find everything on the inf on the uh, global website and also the website created by Hello Tomorrow. And of course, our team is here for any questions uh, that you have. I'm always happy here to answer. Uh, and I think we can get it started. Yes, Alva, please. Yes, um, of course, uh, just for everyone, you can pass your own slides. Everyone can pass the slides in the, uh, during the event. So uh, Noah, feel free to, to pass every slide so you can introduce the judges, etc. Yes, um, good question. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Sorry, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so here I want to, you know, uh, say a first, a huge thank you to our judges. As I mentioned, we have someone joining from the, the Pacific West uh, team, which is the Director of Hardware Engineering of Health at OPPO. He was also at our event last week in Tel Aviv. Uh, we also have another gentleman from OPPO. He is in my team. He's the Principal Strategy Manager, Adi. Uh, our friends from the Europe is Saurabh Tak, and uh, he's from Hello Tomorrow. And here also a huge shout out to Alba and Vincent for helping us and supporting us with everything regarding this competition and challenge. Uh, last but not least is Wilfried, and he is from Zero Project, and he should be sitting uh, in this home or office now in Austria. Uh, for any of you contestants, if you're willing to be connected to our judges after the event, of course, uh, for any discussions, uh, opportunities, feel free to reach out to them or through us. We're happy to make the connection. So yes, uh, here are the 10 startups that's joining us today. Uh, again, as I mentioned, all good candidates were very, very well evaluated by the whole team. Uh, everyone was great, but uh, you know, due to the time limit, we couldn't have uh, every good proposal to be here. And congratulations for the top 10 from Europe uh, and also uh, the other areas, uh, I think also from Turkey as well, for being in this event. And that uh, this is gonna be the presentation order and uh, we're gonna get started. Um, just also a quick note, uh, we will set a timer. So as you already know, it's five minutes for each speech and three minutes for question and answer. So we will set a timer so um, yeah, you can be aware of how much time you have left. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes, we're here perfectly. Hey, nice, nice. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, yeah, just a sec. Mm. Okay, I think that you now can see it, right? Yeah. Oh, sure, I, I will start. Well, I'm, good evening. I'm Jose Carlos Montesinos, Telecom Engineer and CTO at Medicsen, where we have created the ideal software companion to anticipate diabetes. And we found the company because a few years ago, our CEO Eduardo saw in his hospital consult how a young girl with diabetes refused to keep following the treatment. She complained about not knowing if her glucose was going to be safe or drop off all of a sudden so she couldn't make plans and was constantly worried. 
Uh, on top of that, she has to inject insulin at least three times a day, which means over a hundred, a thousand injections per year. Such as her, 80% of patients with diabetes identify needles and uncertainty as the main problem to achieve an appropriate glucose control. For this reason, seven out of 10 patients have proof that the diabetes control that makes them a 20% more expensive for the healthcare providers and generates an average loss of 10 years lifetime. All of this could change if patients had personalized, predictive and non-invasive support tools to improve their glucose control and quality of life. So we created Sugim, a certified medical device app that can tell patients what will happen with their glucose if they eat, exercise or inject insulin. To do that, Sugim automates data tracking by connecting to a third party continuous glucose sensors that come with millions of patients worldwide. It interacts with the user through a friendly chatbot where introducing non-automated data as meals is as simple as sending a text voice messaging saying I ate a social salad normal size. And we know that life is hectic and it's easy to forget having information to us. So we train the system to detect missed events like uh, food intake without the user telling us. All the complex environment of diabetes data require a lot of user interaction uh, with Sugin is reduced to automatically find automatically finding patterns in glucose data. With a structure, Sugin can predict future glucose levels up to two hours in advance, answer doubts as what happens if I run 30 minutes or what if I drink uh, a Coke. And also for a personalized practical insights such as telling the patient to eat eggs instead of pasta at night because it's producing a bad glucose spike during sleep. And this significant improvement because current apps for diabetes either act as simple diaries to log data, or in case they predict, they require a lot of data points and they reach a limit accuracy. Sugin is the ideal companion. Uh, Sugin is the ideal companion uh, and it has also a flexible backend that automatically tracks and transforms data from different sources so the user spends less time. It has individual machine learning models that understand the physiology of each patient with diabetes to predict with higher accuracy than competitors. And it offers practical, usable, and medically certified information that is relevant to the daily life of patients. In two words, automatic certainty. Our goal is to make sure that patients know how to behave so they can increase their glucose control and the quality and length of their life. Because in medicine, we're also developing a needle-free drug delivery small batch for insulin, a device that will be autonomously beside the amount of insulin and the moment of administration without user interaction, thanks to the guidance of the software. So the long-term evolution of Sugen is to act as a controller of insulin delivery devices to enable the creation of an artificial pancreas. And it will be also possible to adapt it to other chronic diseases that benefit from monitoring physiological parameters. For example, to predict uh, epidemic seizures or cardiovascular diseases. This technology is possible thanks to a wonderful team with over 15 professionals, including engineers coming from NASA and MIT, and a healthcare team that grew up in Philips and Rush. We have a strong business side that sold medical technology in the past. We just released the app a few months ago and started generating traction. The algorithms can be integrated in third-party software systems through an API and results can already be checked by the patient's caregiver. We believe that Oppo can help us with our challenge of improving user engagement, connecting to additional data sources, and optimizing the cloud infrastructure. So we hope that you join us to shape the future of diabetes management. Thank you. Great, now the mic is back to the judges. Hello, all the judges. If you could unmute yourself, if you have any questions, and my camera's on, so hi, everyone. Adi, you want to start? I can start, I don't know, hi. <laughs> hi, Sarah, hi, sorry. So, sorry for being late, and uh, I mean, uh, I was in another call, and but um, really good pitch. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, Jose Carlos. Jose, I'm Jose, Jose Carlos. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi, really good pitch. Uh, I, I just have a very basic question, I mean, because you're, you're your app is based on machine learning. Uh, how much data set you already have on what you're talking about? Yeah, we have several patients. We have several sources of patients. We started with only acquiring data from our own users, but we gain access to several databases, uh, 
uh, we use a very, very um, useful database with a lot of data, which means that has um, around two to three months of continuous glucose monitor data, including also foods, including also sports, including injection of insulin uh, of around 40 patients. We have also access to a database of more of uh, 100 patients. We have several, several but I think in, in com complete, we will have data from around 500 users, more or less, but patients. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm happy with the 500 number, but 40 is, is for me, is, is not enough to have a very good prediction. Let's just say that. But yeah, I mean, if you're going to 500, it'll, it'll be a good prediction. But I also like the fact that you're following them for several months, not just, uh, it's not a small time detection. Okay, uh, that, that was my question. Thank you. So, so quick question. So you're predicting glucose based on external sensors data? Yes. Which main sensors do you use now? We connect right now with the Abbott Free Estate Library 2, and we also connect with the Dexcom G6 sensor, and we also connect with a uh, um, kind of service called NiceCout that connects with additional sensors. Uh, and we also connect with Google Fit in order to acquire um, activity data as well. Okay, and your batch uh, is is aimed at uh, monitoring or or uh, administering as well. Uh, it, it only administers. We rely on monitorization in, in third party devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, any partnerships, pilots, or or just in in. Uh, research and building the model stage uh we are working in in order to uh, get some partnerships with these uh device manufacturers but we are haven't start um, done any yet okay i think that's more or less the time uh thank you very much and uh we will move Thanks. to our next startup Um, also, just um, just for everyone to to be clear, you, all the decks that you submitted are in the presentation, so there is no need for you to share your screen to you just uh, have your decks here. Hello, everyone. I guess I, you can hear me. Yes, perfectly. So how am I, uh, if I want to change my deck? Ah, okay. You should be able to change it just with your uh, normal keyboard. You can try before we set the timer. Is it working? We cannot hear you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just pressing any button in my keyboard, but it's not changing. Hmm. So I just have to tell you to change or. Um, so then if you want to share your screen, that would be okay. And if you prefer to let me know when I share, when I change the, the the slide that's or I'll well. just tell the next slide please or something like that. Is that okay? Okay, perfect for me. Okay, so I'll just start. Hello everybody, my name is Yunus. I'm CEO and co-founder of Avocadio. Avocadio is a combination of a hardware and a software. Hardware part is a portable breath analysis device and software is a mobile app providing nutritional advice. So next slide, next slide please. Can you change? Okay. So most people uh, fail to make right and healthy nutritional choices because there's lack of solutions providing them with their personalized uh, instant inside data for uh, providing uh, really accurate uh, nutritional advice. So wrong decisions are being made and people uh, end up with a really uh, difficult situation and uh, like problems like being overweight or obesity. So uh, we just want to create a solution for this problem. And next slide, please. 
So we have developed a portable device measuring specific gases in human breath, such as ketones, ammonia, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide, which gives an instant indication about how our body is handling the food that we eat. And then we send this data to our mobile app. And through our mobile app, we give um, nutrition advice based on this insight data according to the goal of the consumer. So next slide, please. So in technology, in terms of technology, we use MEMS semiconductor sensors, which are quite small and uh, relatively cost effective for a consumer product and low energy usage. We get the raw data from the sensors and send it to our mobile app and do the data processing. And then we convert it into a consumer application uh, so that consumers could understand and they can get some nutrition advice. So next slide, please. So we have two basic uh, co-founders. Uh, Gurjan Garibald is an, uh, a professor for dietetics and nutrition. Uh, she has experience on obesity treatment more than 20 years in some scientific papers. And she already has three patented uh, functional food products which have been sold uh, at the market. I have business studies degree and I have more than uh, 20 years of this development experience. And in our team, we have some uh, engineers for product development and a small sales team. Next slide, please. So our revenue model is based on device sale and subscription model. Next slide, please. So breath analysis is a new emerging area, but we have some competitors. The main difference that's distinguishing us is that we can measure multiple gas uh, from breath and give a better uh, metabolism uh, information and provide nutrition advice based on this data. Next, please. So uh, until now, we did some clinical trials. Uh, we have published uh, a scientific paper of our first clinical trial. And the second clinical trial, uh, we had did a presentation in uh, International Congress last month. And after scientific approved our product, we did some uh, first version of our product and some sales. And now we are updating our product and doing the second version. And we want to launch the market where it's a manufacturing process of the second part. So next, please. So we have attended a CS show in uh, Las Vegas and we have received some uh, consumer feedback and some interest from uh, global uh, for our product and solution. Next, please. So uh, we, we believe that breath analysis has a potential for the future. We know that uh, you, Oppo is uh, and so many uh, promoting consumers to take pictures of the foods that they eat and send it, uh, but uh, also this pro, uh, application could also give an indication uh, of how these foods are uh, affecting their uh, metabolism so that we by embedding avocado into a mobile phone we believe that in the maybe short future uh, it can create a new application uh, for a mobile app next okay thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions um Can I go? Yes, of course. Yeah. Hi, Toma. Uh, really good pitch. Uh, so I have two different line of thoughts basically here. So I went through your pitch as well. And uh, the last thing that was written in the pitch was that diabetes and cancer can be predicted and sub uh, subsequently treatment can be offered basically. So this is my one question and I'm asking the second at the same time so that you can answer both. Uh, so the hardware at the moment is outside of a phone. Can it be integrated in a phone? Because if it's outside of a phone, it has to be it has to be purchased separately. I'm thinking from a customer point of view, uh, how are you going to, is it possible that it can be integrated in a phone directly? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, the second question it me ask because that's something that we want to do in, uh, in the short uh, future. Uh, that's why I said for short future. In terms of, uh, as I told you that it's a MAM sensor, it, it requires low energy, so it can be implemented easily. The only thing that could need a little bit engineering is how uh, consumers could uh, breathe into a mobile uh, phone. So uh, if that can be sold, uh, that probably it needs a little bit kind of design approach as well. So it can be uh, integrated into a mobile app uh, because these sensors, uh, because uh, I mean, the device is not so big, I can show you it is something like this small. Uh, and the thing is that it, because, it, because of the battery, it's so big, it can even be smaller. But the mobile app has, the mobile phone has already a battery, so it can even be smaller. For diabetes, part it's uh, I mean the first pitch was I I assume it was about type one diabetes, so it it requires a little bit more uh, medical approach. But we say it's uh, what our approach is about 
uh, type 2 diabetes, which is about um, eating and unhealthy eating causing uh, obesity and is causing type 2 diabetes. So we are not claiming to be a medical device, but we can help people uh, make right food decisions and then maybe help them with that. No, I really like the idea of, of having a breath analyzer, basically. I mean, health analysis by breath in a phone. This is why I was asking the question, but thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, if we have time, have a couple of questions. So one is, uh, when is the user supposed to use, uh, how frequently and when are you supposed to use this device? Uh, that's the first question. And the second is, what's your... Uh, benchmark or baseline to compare against you know questionnaire or microbiome or, or why 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 do i need uh, like day two claim you do one time microbiome analysis and based on that you have a diet for life so these are the two questions the usage pattern and what do you compare it against because you know it's not hardcore medical it's yeah. kind of a gray area that's exactly true. We are not a, a medical device. So, uh, I mean, the consumer can use the product frequently after one hour after each meal, for example, so that they have consumed the food and one hour could be a good idea that uh, can get this information from the metabol metabolism. So um, they can use it frequently during the day or and some when they wake up before eating something. But for three or four times could be enough. Uh, and... Um, Breath analysis is a new uh, emerging area. Uh, it has new uh, and different applications. I'm sure it will be more popular in the near future. So uh, the, easy, the easy part is that you can do it uh, easily, not like microbiome. I mean, you don't have to, uh, I mean, you can't do it every time, but breath analysis, you can do it um, easily during the day. So, uh, and it, uh, it also creates continuous data uh, collecting. So we can collect data because it's easy to use. So consumers can use it and we can use more data. The more data will uh, enable us to uh, use more, um, with, the, with this data set, we can use more predictive models and, uh, or maybe something more with machine learning algorithms. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to the next startup presenting. Hi, everyone. So, the, the, the errors doesn't work to, to pass the slide. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, can, okay can I you? Oh, okay, yeah, you can share your screen if you prefer. Sure. <laughs> it's okay for all, but so far, but so okay for me. No, no problem. But we, we can start. <laughs> So I'm Thomas Bejo, product manager at Electronica, and I'm here to present you for the, in the context of the challenge uh, our new product, Rhythm, that we are currently developing. Can go next slide. <clears throat> so basically, Electronica is a French startup, startup uh, launched uh, seven years ago, and our mission is to enhance the user experience with HMI and the digital world for better understanding, accessibility, and appreciation of it through haptics. So we are expert in haptics, which is the science of touch, and Precisely in the vibrotactile component of Tunch, and we develop a cutting edge technology uh, from hardware solution, vibration motors, control electronics to software. Uh, and we cover the whole value chain of our industries to that. And we also provide engineering and design services to help our clients integrate haptic in, uh, in their new products. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so, at the origin of the Reason project, there's uh, Claire Richards' research work. Who, uh, she is a PhD student in our company. And when she was young, her audiologist identified her in, uh, hearing disabilities. But despite that, she always had a passion for music. And since then, today, she's leading research on the link, the perceptual link between hearing and feeling, tactile feeling. And <clears throat> Electronica, we are on that subject. We are developing new technology to like expose those capabilities. You can go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, so on the market, there are uh, already a few devices integrating haptic, uh, a few headsets in the audio headsets integrating haptics, but all of them are using it to boost the best, uh, basically. And while 
it's teaser feature, it doesn't uh, use the whole possibilities and capabilities of haptics. And with Rhythm, our mission is to develop a device that uh, will make music and sound accessible to everyone by combining the hearing and feeling the music. Next slide, please. So basically, Rhythm is a neckbound device integrating uh, high definition haptic and audio to propose a new multisensory listening experience with the goal to enhance the experience first, but also make it more intuitive for everyone to, to appreciate it. It is driven by AI and DSP algorithm we are working on to, <coughs> to detect and transcribe sound, uh, sound artifacts to haptic one and specialize it all around the, the, the neck band. Can go to the next slide. Uh, so the main use cases is for sure the music listening, but we also see an interest for to watch movie at home, and also has the device has direct contact with the body. It, we see opportunities in encouraging self awareness and calmness through relaxation exercises. And our main target are elderly people, hearing type, and for sure music lovers. Next slide, please. So the interest we see with, uh, through that, this challenge is having the opportunity of integrating Rhythm with it, uh, Oppose Accessories project line, and collaborate together with uh, Oppose Expert to accelerate the different lifting of both technological and business lock and help us accelerate uh, the go-to-market for that product. Mm -hmm. And in the long-term view, we believe that we could, with Hopo, develop new products to develop uh, human-centric uh, devices. Um, that's all. That's the next slide, but that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. I, I let you go other judges first because I start all, all the time. Hi. Hi. Thomas. Uh, quick question. So RISE is a very specific uh, solution right it's a new product we are currently developing with a, yeah uh, with a new target we are, at the origin we are a haptic technology provider and we start developing hand products uh, in order to showcase specific fit features and the possibilities of haptics so my question is when do you believe you have a kind of a solid uh, demo of it ready <laughs> so we are currently working on both the electronic the mechanical design and the software design. We expect to have a uh, functional, we have few technical parts uh, functional and we are going to assemble that by uh, September. And we expect to have the product launch uh, end of next year. So, so you'll have a functional demo around end of September already? Yeah, we, we have prototypes for now. Okay. But it's not like all integrated prototypes. Yeah, it's a, it's a project we started this year. And, okay. uh, Our target is uh, December to, to have a working. Yeah, uh, demo. we'll have <laughs> by December we'll have a working prototype too, for sure. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Sarah. Now it's your turn. Uh, I, I can go. Okay, I thought the time was over. I mean. I had the same question, what phase of development are you in? Because uh, I would really like to see if, if you were already able to, let's say, translate a, a song into tactile tactile signals. Let's say, okay. we, so basically, we have the first DSP algorithm. We are linking it to AI algorithm currently. Uh, and we are also working on embedding it uh, on microcontrollers. <laughs> uh, so the, the project has started like in February. Because we we won a, an innovation challenge with the with friends, basically, so that uh, helped us starting the project. And yeah, so it's it's in active development right now. And uh, our goal is to get a first prototype around between September and December, so that we can do the first user evaluation, and then go forward and start the industrialization in, uh, in summer 2023. In that case, I have a tougher question. Let's say, uh, is is there any any uh, let's say um, 
hope for blind people basically we visually challenge people for this product another one because in your pitch i i also read yeah. the last line was basically talking about autism can you reflect some light on it let's say it's another sub subject we are working with another company with uh, another french company but uh, so yeah in the end haptics can be used to enhance to 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 be a substitute of another sense in some way, but also complement those senses. That, that, that's the idea we are trying to push by combining music and haptic in rhythm. But for sure, it could be also a substitute for vision for blind people, but that will not be rhythm, but that's another subject we are working on with the French startup here. And autism? Mm, that's not a subject we are working on. That's a specific one, yeah. But for, for sure, there's still place of, for research in those subjects. Oh, all right, thank you. Yes, time is up. Please, thank Albert you. Health, get ready. Hello, I am Sardar from Albert Health. Uh, I prefer sharing my screen, if it's okay for you. Yeah, it's okay. Go for it. Okay. Hi. Hi again. Uh, Albert is a voice based digital health platform. I am the co founder and CEO of the company. We founded Albert in 2018 in the UK as a three former Siemens employees. And so far, we have raised $1.5 million from local and international investors, such as Techstars, one of the biggest global startup accelerators. Uh, the problem we are solving is the first medication adherence. 50% of people with chronic diseases do not take the medications as prescribed. And to each disease, or we can say each person, has different dynamics and they need specialized, personalized solution. Yes, there are many apps in the markets, but the biggest problem of digital health is low engagement. And especially interfaces are not adaptable for people of all ages. As Albert said, we believe the voice is the future, the natural interface for every human. Albert is a voice-based digital health platform. We have a voice assistant, his name is Albert, like Siri, but in healthcare. In medical voice recognition and language processing are our core technology. Under this core technology, we are offering digital health services. The main ones are the health management, the telehealth, and symptom checking. But the important point here is the serving the offering the personalized experience so in albert we are creating persona specific health management programs for healthcare players since and we are all running these programs in just one mobile app since we already have a ready to use digital health services and already trained language model in healthcare we are just creating persona specific parameters reminders persona specific language model training and we are going live in four weeks in mobile app. These personas, by the way, for example, could be the hypertension patients or patients with migraine or mothers, pregnant, elderly people. They are, you know, we are a single platform for our customers, for their all target audiences. They can, for example, uh, they can create three different uh, pl programs and they're, uh, they're, uh, they're via same mobile application everyone see a personalized and the special contents thanks to dynamic link or uh, so-called deep link technology these are our example screens i want to show you the, how uh, you know the configurable it is we are creating special reminders uh, there are also already our medication adherence features uh, you know uh, the patient can patient or the users can reach the videos supportive documents in app they can connect with the healthcare professionals or uh, they can talk with our uh, AI-based language model. So it's like the end-to-end -end health management program, which is very specific to their diseases or their conditions. I want to show you the example as well. It's a real-time real example, real-life example of migraine. I hope you are hearing Albert. Maybe you can read it uh, 
at the same time because I cannot read properly. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's the example of the migraine attack uh, diary. Uh, the patient Albert is asking uh, after the finishing. I will summarize. Sorry, let me summarize it. I will. Uh, the patient, uh, the uh, Albert is asking questions about the migraine attack, and patients is giving information about that. Keeping diary is very important in migraine treatment. So I'll, we trained our language model specifically for the migraine, and uh, we are helping patients to get the data, the data and reporting this data to the healthcare professionals. And uh, you know we are bridging the patients and healthcare professionals by using the power of the voice. Of course, regulations and standards are very important in our market. We all we have ISO twenty seven thousand one, ISO twenty seven seven hundred one, a certificate for information security. We, our solution is validated and we are also complying, complied with the NHS regulations, the digital technology assessment criteria of the NHS. It's very, uh, it was a very important milestone for our company. What we have done so far, our first market was Turkey. We have reached 100,000 registered users in Turkey. Uh, we are actively working with the big pharma like Sanofi, Bayer, Novartis, Roche, Abbott, Pfizer and also the healthcare players such as NN and Siemens. As a last, as a last slide, uh, we know that uh, the, you know, uh, if, you want, if you want to create a global impact, we should co-create. And Oppo is a very strong brand, you know, it's technology capability and some extensive market reach. Albert is very good at the NLP, natural language processing. We are very flexible as a startup to engage different channels and we are Fully complied, validated digital health infrastructure. We can build together a unique, global, and scalable solution. Thank you. I will be happy to answer your questions. All right, I'm gonna go again. <laughs> uh, hello, a really good pitch again. And um, I was wondering, uh, have you looked at your competitive landscape? Because I can, I, I, there are many uh, applications out there which are bridging patients to HCPs. Let's say, how are you better? Actually, the what's your edge? Yeah, our main differentiator is the voice comments. You know, the digital the, the engagement is a very big problem in digital health, especially elderly people suffer the most from the chronic diseases, for example. But the the solutions are not adaptable for them. But they're in our application. They are just talking. They are just talking, and they can you know manage their medication in easy and effortless way. Voice is a great tool to gather the data, which is very critical in digital health to help them. Uh, and also the way, you know, interactive, the fun is you are just talking and uh, you can handle your, uh, your tasks. Our main differentiator is the voice. Yeah. By the way, I, I didn't mention, but yeah. we are, you know, we are continuously training our language model with our in-house medical doctor, AI expert, and linguists. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, <clears throat> I'll still uh, add to that. So, so I, I also noticed it's uh, kind of there's company or com companies or companies that specialize in adherence. There's companies that specialize in, in the symptom checker uh, aspect. So trying to understand what is kind of the voice. Uh, in the end, it's uh, NLP, I believe. Uh, uh, I don't know, MediSafe maybe also have uh, their own chatbot. And I saw many, many uh, bots, NLP bots, symptom checkers usually are done like that. So like, how are you? Are gonna position yourself uh, in, in this domain, or and where where you gonna? What kind of partnership or business model uh, are you targeting and that you believe that you'll have an edge or advantage over these companies which which are a bit older? Uh, proven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, I I think I should mention our division because. As you said, yeah, actually, the general, in general way, the digital health companies are differentiated in two ways, technological and the medical. In technology side, yes, the, the, we are using the power of the NLP, and we are 
and creating just the disease specific solutions, not like MedSafe, the general way, but the disease specific experience and the, or the persona specific experience. But in the second way is more important, the medical differentiation. We hired the two medical doctors in our team and now we are, we are understanding the you know, progress of our each programs. And after that, we will focus on some therapeutic areas and we will leave the other ones. Our biggest partners are here, our uh, biggest partners are the uh, pharma companies, by the way. We are the, working with the seven of big 10 uh, pharma companies like Pfizer, about Bayer, uh, uh, Roche. And we are creating very specific disease management programs with them. And our vision is to creating digital therapeutics products, which is very you know, validated solutions, medically validated and also validated in terms of health economics, which is prescribable and reimbursable uh, solution. Now we, we also started in clinical trials uh, for this vision, uh, first uh, in telephysiotherapy, then uh, the heart in heart failure. And the, we will you know, narrow down our focus and the, we will create the depth of the, uh, the, our, the medical uh, site and we will create the digital therapeutic solution. This is the, our long-term position of our company. That's, so, so your... Uh, sorry, Adi, I think... No problem. Yes, I'm sorry that I'm stopping in here. But uh, for more questions, yeah, feel free to put in the chat. And uh, I think the people can also answer here, which is a very have a tight schedule. Sorry, can we have the next contestants, please? AR exhibition. Do we have it here? Someone? Okay, I guess, uh, uh, do we have the representative from IDU? Mark? No, we yeah, have yes. Charles yes, uh, mentioned, can you hear me? So, Sorry, who is speaking now? Uh, me, Adi. Charles wrote, can you hear me? Maybe, maybe he's from ARX Vision. Oh, um, no, we cannot hear you. Uh, Charles, we can. Maybe you want to try to connect and disconnect. Uh, sorry, disconnect and connect. Maybe we can have uh, Idun I, to be on the stage first. Like oh. now. Is it now? Is it now you? Okay. Yeah, that's me. Hey, hi. Great. Can you see me? Can you see me? Yes, perfect. Please go ahead. Excellent. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Leclerc. I am the co-founder and the CEO of ARX Vision. At ARX, we augment reality with audio for the blind and low vision. But before the big, really, the big reveal, let me tell you why this matters. Can we have the next slide, please? Globally, there are half a billion blind and visually impaired people. Next slide, please. In the US and EU, this is 46 million blind and see, can I have the next slide, please? In the US and the EU, it's 46 million blind and moderate to severe visually impaired. Well, this is hard for individuals. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this, these individuals find it difficult to be independent because their condition makes it hard to attend social events to attend education and to secure and maintain employment. Next slide, please. While this is hard for individuals, the economical impact of government is, for example, in the US, over $400 billion a year. So solving this problem will help society as a whole. In addition, it is aligned with the UN goals to eradicate poverty, hunger, and to promote decent work and economical growth for all. But there is hope. Next slide, please. There are amazing apps available out there. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, apps still require the users to be holding their phones in front of them. And this is not always the best user experience. Next slide, please. Imagine being in a city center 
with your guide dog, your wild cane, your groceries. And on top of this, you need to hold your smartphone in front of you to know if it is safe to cross the road. People have been requesting a hands-free access to technology for decades. Next slide, please. And there are existing wearable solutions out there. Unfortunately, they are very expensive. They are not always designed for blind and visually impaired, making them hard to use. And they are closed systems. It's one wearable, one app, limiting the potential of the use cases. Next slide, please. The market needs a low price, compatible, easy to use wearable device. In other words, the market needs ARX Vision. Next slide, please. ARX Vision is a headset that connects to a smartphone. When you wear the ARX headset, you can launch the ARX app. Next slide, please. The ARX app enables you to scan and read documents. It enables you to recognize faces and describe scenes and much more. Next slide, please. The way ARX works is uh, by the headset scanning surroundings and sending data to a smartphone. The smartphone uses cloud computing, computer vision, AI, and machine learning to infer knowledge from the images and the audio and translates this knowledge into audio back to the user through the bone conduction speakers on the headset. ARX is designed as an accessory, uh, which means it doesn't replicate the expensive components that are present in a smartphone, such as the CPU, the GPU, or the battery. And this has two key advantages. The first one is that ARX evolves over time. As new smartphones come on the market, ARX is still up to date. The second advantage, next slide, please, is the price. ARX is much cheaper than the competition. Next slide, please. ARX was designed for blind and visually impaired specifically. And our users keep telling us that they love the physical buttons as well as the voice interface that uses natural language processing. Next slide, please. Third party developers can use our SDK to upgrade their apps to uh, work with the hands-free experience. Next slide, please. Next slide. And while we're working with research and academia and partnering uh, with the likes of NYU, London Health and Virginia Tech, Next slide. We're extremely excited to announce our partnership with IRA. IRA connects remote agents and blind people to deliver on-demand live visual information. Next slide, please. For example, in some factories, blind employees rely on IRA agents to complete their jobs daily. And for the first time, these people will be able to have a hands-free experience uh, thanks to our partnership. So we're already delivering value empowering people to keep their jobs and, be, and uh, be more employable. Next slide, please. And this is only the beginning. We are very excited to announce all of our other partnerships. So far, we've generated over $10,000 of revenue. We have a growing user base and a growing list of distributors and uh, retailers. Next slide, please. And uh, we're... We'll, uh, while we'll be excited to focus on sales and growth, we are really excited about uh, tackling different verticals and also very excited about uh, collaborating with OPPO on uh, Android compatibility and so much more. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Hi, Charles. Without wasting any time, basically. <laughs> Hi, really great pitch. I mean, really liked it. Now, two, two, two train of thoughts, basically, for me. So how many, I mean, uh, definitely have tested a device. How many uh, subjects do you have you tested this device on? And I mean, not in the lab, but like out there. Oh, yeah. So we actually have uh, more than 10 users, more than 10 paying users. And people who have the device is probably 20 or 30 people. Hmm. And so we're already collecting data about, you know, how much they use it every week and so on. All right. Um, you said it's cheaper than the closest competition, let's say. What is your closest competition at the moment? Uh, it's called Envision AI, and it, they use the Google Glasses, and they cost $3,000. And the next one that you for sure know is called Arcam and costs above $4,000. All right. And you, you are providing $1,200, basically. Yeah, $1,300 is our price. $1,300. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, quick question on my end. So uh, the, the main uh, comparison kind of advantage you uh, you have over Orcam is the price point. So no. let's say no. 
affordable. No, it's not the price point. It's the fact that we are a platform. So when you purchase this headset, you can use a lot of apps with it. And we are the only, uh, the only wearable doing this. So, so you claim Orcam is a closed system or they, they choose not to uh, add apps to it? Well, what's the... Uh... Well, Orcam, yes, they are a closed system. So it's a bespoke device that doesn't work with a smartphone. But most blind people already have an iPhone or an Android device. And they already use a lot of apps that are very good at doing specific things. So we are basically offering hands-free to all of these apps. What is the market penetration of these devices that you know, Orcam, Vision? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. It's about 20,000. I, I know that Orcam has sold of above 10,000 devices. Uh, on average, in this sector, you can expect to sell 20,000 devices every two, three years. Uh, but actually, where, where, where did they sell them? Sorry? Where? Where did they sell them? In which geography? Uh, in North America and Europe, mainly. Which is kind of very small percentage of the target audience, right? Absolutely, yes, you're right. There's a big audience in Asia and in India. Uh, and on the no, no, I mean, even in US and Europe, Europe yes. 20, 30, 70 is a very small percentage of the target audience of visually impaired. Absolutely. Up to blind. Yeah, so that's why we think we can do much better by being a platform and by being a lot more affordable. Okay. I think that's all the questions. Thank you very much. And let's move to the next one. Idun, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm ready to start. Uh, so welcome. My name is Mark Mandakovic. I'm a product manager and application engineer by Eden Technologies. And essentially, we're creating neuro-enhanced earbuds. Next slide, please. So I believe everyone in this uh, webinar right now, as well as everyone in the world, shares a very common attribute of being human, which is sleep. I mean, essentially, if you don't sleep, you, you die with a few different disorders. It's a thing that really binds us together as, as a society across the world. And sleep is really linked to many things which you don't realize every day, including many disorders, such as diabetes, hypertension, Alzheimer's, but also just allowing us to live the best life that we want to live as a person. Your ability to regulate your emotions, to have your best cognition, this is all related to sleep. And this is why as a company, Eden is really focused on sleep. Next slide, please. Eden is a spinoff of the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And we're a holistic team, which includes material scientists, neuroscientists, product developers, marketing people, customer support. And we're all coming together to create a full stack neurointelligence earbud platform. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of uh, perspective of why we came to this OPA challenge, we started as a, sense, a biosensor company for measuring EEG or EMG on the body. Last year, we delivered our first development kit, which allows us to measure EEG from inside the ear canal, allowing us to create a very ubiquitous, very easy to use brain computer interface. And in the next phase of our company development, we want to go into a deployment and integration with consumer electronics companies, because our eventual goal is to bring all this neuroscience and neurotechnology into true wireless earbuds, which can be scaled to hundreds of millions of users worldwide and help them solve problems in sleep and then expand into other neuromarker, biomarker uh, application areas, which could include music and media and a multitude of other use cases. Next slide, please. And when I say we're a full stack neural intelligence company, it means that we control the entire pipeline from developing conductive polymer electrode ear tips, which then connect to our hardware, which is becoming a miniaturized hearable, to then integrating with our cloud platform where we can extract actionable insights 
and then send these back to connected applications through our SDK and API. Next slide, please. And this means that when you're working with a company such as OPPO, you can come in at different points in an interaction. First as hardware integration, but also if you have a specific data algorithm, for example, for sleep or for music enjoyment, we can bring this in to the entire product experience and then create new ways to interact with devices which we thought we understood, such as different ways to watch movies or to enjoy music. Next slide, please. And to give you an idea for what we're really achieving as, as, a, as a company, when we talk about validating our technology, we do it according to the gold standard. So we've already gone through studies where we evaluate our ability to capture brain activity from inside the ear canal as related to sleep staging and compared it to the gold standard. So instead of having a bunch of wet electrodes over your scalp, we just have a simple device which takes about 15 seconds to put on. Next slide, please. And I'm very happy to show that we're able to capture the data of your brain, especially when you're sleeping, capturing microarchitectures such as sleep spindles and cake complexes, which allows us to then do sleep staging, very similar to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine standard. Next slide, please. And even we can you know, really track how a person is falling asleep or waking up during the day or the evening. And this allows us to really augment what is possible with existing wearable devices. Next slide, please. And that's why I was really interested to come to this challenge, because I believe that by combining the best of what Eden has been able to achieve so far, so validating in-ear technology, making it so that it's actually manufacturable and scalable, because we've, we've had this idea and this dream to move towards a company like Oppo, essentially over the past two years. And when I see the product ecosystem that OPPO has already developed, the customers that you already have, our goal of being able to create a magical product you know, with a partner such as you, I think it really becomes a, a reality of a real potential. Because by combining wearable sensors such as smartwatches with the brain, we can really open up new use cases. And I'm very welcome to your questions. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Um... Hi. I think I've been starting the first time, starting again the first, and once again, two train <laughs> thoughts here. Uh, one is on the number of data sets you have, you use for clinical, uh, not the clinical validation, but the validation. Uh, and mm -hmm. second, more general, basically comparison, because the smart watches, for instance, can show you your sleep patterns based on the heartbeat, basically. They mm -hmm. measure the pulse, not the heartbeat, the pulse. Uh, yeah. They can show you your sleep pattern, basically, and which is not, let's say, not 100% accurate, but it's very close to being accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the differentiating factor for IDEN than these ones? And I, I get one part very clearly that you are very close to EEG, but I still like to know more, mm -hmm. let's say, the edge you will have in the market. Is, uh, no, that's an awesome question. So with wearables, for example, yes, you can track basically how long you've been asleep. Question is, how can we track the quality of sleep? And how can we track those micro features that are actually relating to different disorders. So for example, I show that we can discern sleep spindles. Sleep spindles are not just markers for how we are in different sleep stages. We are also seeing in research how they're being related to different disorders such as schizophrenia, as well as memory um, rejuvenation. So for example, when you're learning and you fall asleep, we know that there's a very good correlation between how you're sleeping, how your memory is reconsolidating during the night. And but what's really made on schizophrenia or something else other than normal sleep. And this is this is what I I mean, I would be, let's say, would, this is what bring you the edge, basically. But do you already have data mm -hmm. set on it? So we did a first validation study underwritten with Takeda, where we validated our uh, development kit according to the PSG system. And we really went in with the American Academy of Sleep Standards. Uh, so this was a first study on 12 subjects where we really did a maintenance of wakefulness test, so a very involved evaluation. We've also done a lot of validation internally for things like acoustic steady state response, SSVP, uh, when you close your eyes and you see the alpha increase in, in the brain signal, we have tons of data on this as well. And we've been doing pilot projects with different companies to explore different use cases between sleep and hearing. So we're also expanding our data sets continually uh, and doing this alongside product development. Okay, I'm, uh, the reason I asked this question was because this can be also be a diagnostic for a, for a long-term thing. 
Uh, mm, like exactly. a, daily, a daily diagnostic in a phone, basically, and this is really cool. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. Uh, quick question <coughs> from me. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mark. Uh, so, how far is it from being implemented in uh, in earbuds through wireless form factor? So, the true wireless form factor is what we've been building towards over the past two years. Uh, we have a research development project currently running, which will finish in February of 2023, which will give us our TWS reference design. And a big part of our product is also the manufacturability of it. So we don't just have conductive materials that work once. We're building them so they can be injection moldable and really scale to mass market potential. So True Wireless is basically a Q2 Q1, Q2, 2023 as a reference design. And then we will be looking for partners to help miniaturize it, which is also where I think OPPO would be a very amazing candidate. Okay, got it. Thank you, Mark. And now let's sure, pass the mic to Scientaract. <laughs> I wasn't sure if this is the right way to pronounce, so it's a bit reluctant. Centerect, yes. Centerect, sorry for that. That's fine. How do I continue? Um, you can let me know whenever you want to pass the slide or you can present your own. Uh, you can share your screen if you prefer. I think that would be better because I think it's more than 50 slides. All right, you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Yes? Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Gernot, and I'm very excited to be here. Is that the sound that should be? As I am not just building a stair climbing wheelchair, but with Syntrack, we bring doesn't work. We bring gamification into rehabilitation. What would we do without our hand? We couldn't grab, we couldn't type, we couldn't clean. We need our hands in our everyday life. A friend of mine suffered at the age of 15 of a stroke, and he couldn't move his hand anymore. In order to regain his hand function, he had to push rubber balls over and over again. And he is not alone with that. Just in Germany, we have every single year more than 350,000 hand injuries, all followed by these monotonous and time-intensive rehabilitation exercises. But with Syntract, we found a solution to bring this analog rehabilitation into our digital age with a glove to combine the necessary exercises with motivating computer games. Like Luca, who can, by opening and closing of his hand, steer the rocket through the game. And this is unique to take away your question. There is no other system on the market which is that precise in measuring every single finger joint, that affordable, not just for the clinic, but even for the patient himself, and portable. You can literally take this anywhere you want. And to have fun at every position, we created a bunch of games, from slow ones to more to think, or some faster ones. And some of them, you can actually even play with other patients in other clinics together or with your friends. While playing, you can see your statistic. What did you do yesterday? What did you do today? When might your rehabilitation be finished? So all in all, a win, 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 win situation for all participants. Once a patient came to us and said, this is the perfect disability controller because he had the chance to play his computer games with our glove. And this is not the end of the line. Stepping into the virtual environment, you can actually see your own hands and feel virtual objects. 
but who are we? We're a team from the RWTH Aachen University here in Germany and are supported by strong partners. Why we have been able to bring this as a medical device to the market into the Siri production. So this is not a prototype anymore, but a product. And not just in some clinics, but in Europe's largest hospitals, Netherlands rehabilitation centers. And we couldn't have done this without strong partners like Bosch SensorTech, who said about us, a revolution in rehabilitation, the smart glove. But it's not just interesting for here, it is interesting for the whole world. For example, in China, we have 3.6 therapists for over 100,000 people. So it is necessary to train at home because we have closely 4 million of strokes. That's one stroke every eight seconds and a lot more hand injuries that can be treated with our glove. But why OPPO? Of course, you have a smartphone and our glove could run with a smartphone. But there are many more opportunities. For example, using it in VR, you have your own, you're currently working on AR headsets. You need something to interact. We need something to control, to raise awareness for accessibility and industrial use, of course. But we don't want to stop here with the glove. We want to bring our system to the whole body. My name is Gernot Zimmermann, and with Sundrag, we bring gamification into rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Hi. Uh, so, hi, quick question. I'm not sure whether uh, you know, we went into details, but in terms of the technical aspects, what what is the technology, the the components you have in the glove, uh, especially now that uh, uh, haptic gloves they're starting that they're 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 starting to heat up this field. What what do you have in this quite uh, nice glove that's th thin and, uh, and comfortable? Thank you very much. Yeah, so definitely, uh, first of all, it is very small. So as you see, we can just, you can take it anywhere in your trousers and take it anywhere you want. We do have sensors on every finger joint to measure every single finger movement. So even if you do like this or like that, it would be all detected, which is very relevant and crucial for the medical applications because even patients who have just a little tiny bit of movement, they can start training with our glove, with our system, which is not possible in other ways. And which is of course interesting for the virtual reality applications, even though I have to say in our newest version, as you see here, which is on the market, um, we did cut off the fingertips to make it easier to actually use it. And therefore, we had to remove some force sensors we had previously in our glove to measure the forces. Um, but still, it has a lot of benefits. So, so if we compare it to, say, Oculus's uh, for camera based hand tracking and the likes of, I don't know, let's say Crunchfish in Europe. So, so, so what's your advantage compared to really high quality uh, hand, full volumetric hand reconstruction in space, which company, some companies do? So, yeah, of course, we, we ourselves, thank you very much for that question. We ourselves came from Leap Motion. Our first thing which we use is Leap Motion. It is a hand uh, camera detection system. And um, what we recognized, hey, First of all, we want to give the feedback back. We do that with vibration. So we can return something to the user. If he, for example, gets some coins, if he grabs virtual objects, we do register the patent on a construction which can give you force feedback on the glove. However, like what was more crucial, if you have such an application like the rehabilitation, you want to have a stable tracking. And as soon as you overlap your hands, as soon as you make a fist, camera tracking will fail. 
there are a lot of systems to prevent that, but still it will fail. So like tiny motions won't be recognized if you have it not directly in the camera. So having a glove makes you, brings you first of all the haptic component, but as well as a more stable tracking. And I mean, if you look in all the futuristic mu movies like uh, Minority Report, you always have these glove systems. And something like this is set up in two seconds till I get the glove on. So you can easily start with interacting. And this is also a difference to the big glove system, like maybe you had haptics from Oculus or Facebook in mind, something. Uh, of these bigger haptic system, this one is really portable. So in terms of AR or VR, this is something you can actually use in daily life. Yeah, it's more of a sensing uh, device than a haptic Sorry, device. Adi. Oh, no problem. Sorry, again, that I have to stop you here. Sorry, it's always me. At least we're from the same team. Uh, I'm very sorry that you're running out of time. Thank you so much. And we're Thank moving to virtually, I believe. Hi, if it's okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, please go ahead. Can you see everything okay? Perfectly, thank you, we can. Thank you. So my name is Amir Bozorgzade. I am the co-founder and CEO of Virtualeap. We are a company that's combining the neurosciences with virtual reality in order to address the huge impact that cognitive disorders have on society, especially Alzheimer's disease in which the call to action among startups is can we introduce new emerging technologies that can better profile the cognitive health of individuals? And more importantly, can we introduce new methodologies that can detect the early onset of cognitive illnesses like Alzheimer's, not just years, but decades before it ever onsets. The problem is that screen-based devices inherently exclude the body. Virtual reality is the first embodied digital format that engages our whole body, our autonomic nervous system, our vestibular balance system, which means that a whole level, uh, unprecedented level of engagement is happening in this environment. Our data that we're collecting is of a higher quality. The adherence levels is markedly much higher than any screen-based devices. But more importantly, we are capturing volumetric data sets about the human condition, combination of uh, psychometric, psychological data, but on top of physical postural, movement data, the gesticulation of the arms being able to be tracked. And in fact, some of the headsets we work with right now, like the HP OmniSet, they actually collect and capture physiological sensors like heart rate variability, pupil dilation tracking, skin conductivity. And we have integrated algorithms that right now can take these biosensors and calculate the cognitive load of individuals. We know whether the individual is actually stressed out, whether they're focused, whether they're bored out of their minds. This is the real opportunity of working with a partner like OPPO is to not just be able to collect the self-reported sleep data and mood data that we are currently doing, but actually go one step further and get a historical sleep data, exercise data, lifestyle data, and we are designed from the data infrastructure point, ready to go to work with you along these lines. Now, the library of cognitive games that we've designed by our neuroscientists essentially is train and test a range of cognitive abilities, not just the main ones like problem solving and information processing, but also motor control, spatial orientation, and spatial audio awareness. We've created 15 of these highly polished cognitive games. They're available on the B2C stores in Mandarin Chinese, uh, English, Portuguese, Spanish, and Japanese. They don't just go across these seven categories. They actually span across 22 subcategories, like memory breaks down to working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, episodic memory. How we span across this you know, landscape is the first row of neuropsychological assessments that haven't really evolved in the last, I don't know, five to seven decades. Even the, the digitized versions or the second row of 2D brain training apps, the fundamental you know, shift of, of magnitude of what's possible with VR is that it is engaging our whole body, not just one circuitry, but all of the nonverbal circuitry, as well as capturing that whole new dimension of, of data points that only virtual reality is the first embodied digital format can do. Now, um, we've had a lot of traction for the last three years. We've, we've had about 43,000 early registered users. We have five clinical studies currently underway. We just won a pilot with Roche uh, two months ago specific to dementia. We have obviously a roadmap ahead of us that is to you know, validate ourselves as a new gold standard of cognitive assessment and therapeutics. 
However, we don't do not need to wait for regulatory approval to make money. When we came out of stealth last summer, we closed our first 1.5 million in sales, um, licensing our solution for use cases like ADHD and rehabilitation of uh, stroke rehab. Um, we have pilots underway right now, which are applying us for athletics, um, for concussion therapy. Um, uh, we just got results uh, this week on, on positive results of of increasing processing speed in people with ADHD. We are very much agnostic beyond just cognitive decline. And for this year, we have 3.5 million in pending proposals. We're set to make about 5 million by the end of 2022. Our team is a mix of scientists and game developers working hand in hand to show that the critical application of virtual reality above every other application is in addressing the biggest cognitive disorders facing our society today. Thank you. You want to do it? Now that's the that's the first um, task. Uh, pardon me. Was that a question? No, no. I was just uh, giving a view cue to see sure. Mr. Uh, sure. the first group. So, so, uh, so it doesn't look like a setup. Sorry. <laughs> co co cognitive. Uh, so understand your specialty uh, is is focusing on VR because there are this. It's a very competitive field. Uh, there are some big uh, players on the upside, uh, apps. Uh, so, so trying to understand whether it's already competitive in VR as well. Uh, what do you expect to be your advantage in this field compared to, you know, tablet, uh, 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 laptop, other, you know, in the end of the goal, you need to improve cognitive uh, function so, so how will vr <clears throat> do that in a meaningful substantial way compared to all, all of the things we've been doing for the last let's say 30 years sure um you know I, in terms of competitive landscape there is no competitive landscape uh, it took us three years to develop this and as a cockroach um, we work with groups like stanford ucla ucsf and the VA healthcare system uh, if you ask any neurologist uh, from japan to dubai to to again, San Francisco, there we are the, the gold standard and there is no company um, or solution that is even leagues close to having our library of cognitive um, assessment tools, uh, gamified of course, um, which is of course a blue, a, a blue ocean of opportunity. Uh, virtual reality cannot be compared to anything that's screen-based because anything that's screen-based does not, um, uh, it does not hijack the human system in the way that VR does in terms of tricking the autonomic nervous system into believing that you're standing on top of a very tall tower, which makes your knees buckle and shake. And now you're going to tell me that the data from a screen-based device trying to simulate that experience can be as high quality as when you have a visceral um, trickery no, and no. Uh, sorcery. That's not what I mean. I mean the end uh, goal. This is an intermediate plan. The end goal is to improve some cognitive functions. Right. So, so kind of measuring uh, kind of state of the art uh, known uh, platform for cognitive measurement and improvement versus this new platform because VR has been trying to use for uh, different uh, health related like treating heat strokes, treating PTSD, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff. But in terms of penetration, uh, I, I didn't see it yet at, at, on a mass scale. It seems that uh, like you need something like Oculus 2 as an enabler for, for that to become a very common tool and, and then go to all these use cases. That, that's just what I saw uh, in the market. Maybe I'm wrong. So, so my question is, how do you kind of uh, compare it or assess it compared to some common uh, practices or, or things that prove to some extent to be working? Is, is your uh, effect magnitude is substantially stronger than uh, anything else? Okay, so VR can be split between the consumer market and the B2B market, serious use cases, hospitals applying it. The FDA just two years ago created a category called medical extended reality. This is a, a solution that is far above and beyond anything tablet or anything screen based across 8,000 clinical studies across the world for therapeutic use cases that blow any other screen based device out of the water. Um, in terms of cognitive uh, deployments and so on, again, it's very important 
that we are engaging a human being beyond just what's tapping and typing with your fingers and thumbs on a screen. So, um, sorry, just just the thing. Um, did you say eight thousand use cases? I mean, studies from your worldwide. You are worldwide. All oh, right. Okay. Oh yeah, I wouldn't be on this call. I'd be like, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, from Japan to China to many markets around the world, there have been so many therapeutic use cases. For example, pain. Uh, management was the first breakthrough designation by the FDA. Why? Because when you, we are not designed to live in two realities at the same time. When you give the visual sense a different reality, all of the other um, senses are subservient to it. And they, what they found is that the pain receptors in the brain significantly dampen when you're in a VR uh, uh, situation. And so uh, pain management is one of the biggest breakthrough um, applications of virtual reality. Now, when we come to mental health, and cognitive disorders, there is no other solution that's going to be able to engage the human system in a cognitive level as deep as virtual reality is. And when we look at Achilles Interactive two years ago, well, a year and a half ago, being the first game as medicine for the application of ADHD, kids um, 8 to 12 uh, years old, being used as a video game that's prescribable by doctors, then we are the Rolls Royce of that sector designed based on the same neuroscience research according. And, and again, like I mentioned, we're working with Harvard, um, with, with UCLA, all the top neurologists around the world to use the virtual reality superpower. And again, virtual reality is not a mainstream solution at all. I do not believe in consumer VR. I believe in the many hospitals, at least in the US, and, and a lot of partners we're talking to in China and Japan are seeing how significant this technology is for addressing ADHD, for addressing depression, for addressing all sorts of cognitive disorders. I'm sorry to interrupt you for the lack of the time. Adi, if, if, is it okay if I follow up on your question, basically? Please. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what Adi was going for was market adoption. How, do, how far are you from it, basically? Well, I mean, we got, you know, right from coming out of stealth, we got our first 1.5 million in licensing agreements. We have 3.5 million in pending proposals. We got 1 million greenlit last month. We are in terms of market. Let's say on the ground. I, I heard that. I mean, on the ground. How? Because this has to be adopted by the patients as well. Sure. So it has to be adopted by the, not, not just by the big pharma, let's say, mm. but by the doctors and the, uh, and the patients. How far are you from there, basically? I understand you're already licensing it out. And your yeah. business model is basically licensing it out, but I'm just trying to look in, in, a, in a longer future, not immediately. Sure. I mean, we're talking about a virtual reality is called an emerging technology. So to co compare us to an incumbent technology like the ones we have on our phones, that's not what we're designing for. We're not a market uh, mainstream technology. If that. we were, we would be called, not called emerging. Yeah, I, I get that. This is why my question was there. Yeah. But nevertheless, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the heated discussion Q&A session. Now we have to move to Sensei. Uh, yeah. So I just share, share my own slides. Pretty easier. Um, do you prefer to share your screen, or if not, I can. I have the presentation you sent me, and I can um, pass the slides whenever you tell me, as you prefer. Um, I will just share my screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, that didn't work. One sec. Oh, maybe you just tap them. I can't get it to work. If you can, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm Daniel Lindholm. I'm the chief scientist and co-founder of Sensei. We're aiming to build the WHOOP for mental wellness. Okay, next slide. 
So I'm a neuroscientist and physiologist with research experience in neurotech development and sensory perception. My co-founder Olivier is a serial entrepreneur in music and uh, wine, and he was a partner in the Orchard, which was exited to Sony Music. So as entrepreneurs and scientists, we've all suffered with stress and burnout in the past. So this is why we founded Sensei to tackle some of these problems. Next slide. So there's lots of mental health and wellness apps and applications. We've seen a few here as well. Uh, the main problems we see with them is there's a strong lack of engagement and the impact is not measured. And we believe that by measuring the impact and giving tangible feedback to users, we can improve on the engagement significantly. Next slide. So our solution is a wearable, wearable device that sits on your upper arm that can monitor stress using uh, 20 different sensors. Uh, combine this with network analysis and electrological monitoring. And then we use to give feedback to users using haptics and um, personalized haptics. And this is really key. So we, using this interface, we found out we can actually lower stress levels and increase people's focus. And by doing this, we can, using haptics, we can also reduce significant the impact of, negative impact of screen time and we can communicate through touch. So next slide. And I want to just speak a little bit about touch and haptics. We've already heard from Actronica uh, about this, um, but this is really not a new, a new idea. Next slide, please. So, oh, I think, yeah. So the blind community have been using this for decades and more recently as Actronica also exemplifies, this is also gone into the hearing community. What we're doing is actually tapping this into emotions and using touch low frequencies um, to directly affect emotions. And doing this, we have shown that uh, we can have an impact. So next slide, please. And we've patented a solution that allows us to optimize this haptic stimulation for having an impact on users uh, focusing on stress. Um, yeah, next slide. So, and don't just take my word for it, we tested this currently on almost about 150 people. And we show, first of all, we show we can detect stress using our sensors, our device. Uh, but also we show that we can have a significant effect on stress reduction, use monitored monitor monitor by ele electrodermal activity. We can have a significant increase in heart rate variability, and we can actually increase people's performance uh, during a cognitive task under stressful circumstances. Next slide. So we're positioning ourselves between the haptic therapies and monitoring, and we believe that by combining these and integrating these, we can have a big impact on both coaching and mental health tools. Next slide. So our business model is that initially we go b 2 b to c uh, focus on performance, working with coaches and athletes. Then we go into more enterprise and finally going to much more reimbursement model. Okay, next slide. So our initial go to market is a 12 week program where we combine our hardware and app with a coaching life coach. Um, we believe that this integration is key to getting results. Um, we are aiming this for at corporate athletes. The so next slide. And we already have over 200 coaches and therapists in our waiting list. Next slide. So to do this, we have a strong team of neuroscientists, psychologists, as well as machine learning. Um, next slide. Currently raising a 1.2 million round. Um, we already have backing from early business angels in group. And the main for this is to enable our 12-week uh, program. Next slide. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, I don't know if you went uh, into this uh, description. Of what's the physics or neurophysics behind? I know a lot of neuromodulation to treat ABC, uh, including even doing it from the wrist or arm. 
so, so what's the kind of science behind haptics and its effect on mental health, which is very wide, different field? I don't know if, if depression and, and anxiety and uh, so, uh, PTSD all will be treated the same. And how does haptics relate to that? So there's all different mechanisms. So what we're doing is building on top of the research into effective haptics and effective touch that shows using low frequency stimulation and pressure and low frequencies, you can mimic the same effect as um, social touch and stroke. Um, and that can have very big effects on, um, it's particularly stress, uh, but also on anxiety. And there's even studies showing kind of effects on depression and pain. Um, yeah, so don't know if that answers your question. Um, but yeah, the key is to use the sort of low frequency and um, gentle stimulation, and then basically to get the impact for different conditions and different um, aspects of it. We that's why we realize you need to personalize and you need to optimize it for each individual person, which is where the monitoring also comes in. Daniel, hi. Um, how many subjects have you tried it on? So we currently tried it on just sort of 150 people. Um, 150? Yeah. And we're that, currently, no. I'm sorry, go on. That's a good number. And then now we're, Currently starting from September, we're starting a program with coaches and we have another 150 um, devices going live with coaches from September. And when do you expect the data to come back from them, basically? So that goes uh, continuously. So we're initially starting doing a two-week assessment program. So within the first two weeks of each uh, user, we should get data on it and can start building the the model for each person. All right. And this basically goes back into development of the entire program, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Do I have uh, Wolfgang here on the call? Yes, I'm here. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Christopher. I would try to share my screen, but please give me a, a feedback if it will work. Yes, please go ahead. We'll let you know. Sure. No, that's not the right one, I guess. Give me another chance. No. Yes. Will this do? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, a very good afternoon, or in what time zone you are presently. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Zagler, and I'm the senior technician of uh, Tetragon Braille Systems. And I will give you a short introduction into the Braille ring a brand new idea for a tactile device for displaying Braille. So I guess you will agree with me if you look uh, upon yourself uh, that 
education is mainly based on learning how to read and to write. And uh, this is true for just plain text, but also for music, for math, and for all kinds of formula. The invention of a tactile alphabet by Louis Braille almost 200 years ago opened uh, the door to education and uh, to qualified professions for blind people worldwide. The Braille alphabet is based on six tactile dots embossed onto thick paper to be read with the fingertips. What started with uh, embossed dots on paper 200 years ago, meanwhile made its way to the world of computers, of emails and ebooks. And since some 50 years, Braille displays forms a tactile equivalent uh, for our computer screens. But there are still a lot of drawbacks. It's the size and the weight to use such devices in a mobile, mobile fashion. Uh, it's robustness for use in tough environments. For example, in a kindergarten or in tropical countries. And finally, and this uh, might be uh, the main problem, is the affordability, especially for people living in low income countries. So we try to overcome all these drawbacks with two main innovations. The first one is compactness. So conventional braille displays have the characters aligned uh, along a long line. And we tried to roll this long line up and at Tetragon, the characters are now rotating in a compact circle resulting at the end of the day uh, in an inf infinite uh, line. So this is a picture of an early prototype where the braille characters are inside of a circle. The second uh, more important innovation is uh, that we can have much less components. In a conventional display, you have typical 192 actuators. We get along with only nine actuators in a compact block. The development potential could be that we sell uh, 1,000 units per year to high income countries for 1,500 US dollars. But in this way, we would only reach 9% of world's blind population. But if we scale it up and uh, go for a, a economy of scale, let's say for 100,000 units, this means an 80% price reduction with the components. And the components we could offer for just 70 US dollars to be assembled, distributed and serviced locally where the device is needed. There are 40 million blind people worldwide, but 91% are living in low income countries. So our social value should and could be to be cost efficient and robust by the design and promoting braille literacy worldwide and developing a business model to reach disadvantaged regions by just distributing the parts and having things assembled, uh, repaired, distributed locally where the devices are needed. So what we are looking for certainly is financial support, but mainly for a social investor. We are a startup company with just four people working on this and to find partners worldwide to roll out this business model. Thank you very much, and I'm eagerly awaiting your questions. Hi, Wolfgang. Uh, I mean, really, I really like the idea of, of uh, bringing Braille to everybody, basically, kind of thing. Uh, my question is, how do you think, in your opinion, OPPO can pitch in to this project? Sorry, what, what's again? Uh... How do you think OPPO? 
Popo can pitch in the project, yeah. Uh, well, I'm not very familiar with Opera indeed. So uh, what I said, certainly uh, any financial support, but networking. So we as the technicians, we have not the contacts worldwide, uh, not even to organizations at the moment, which would be able to do this job locally. We would train people, we would provide uh, the parts and the software, uh, and what we are looking for is our organizations or partners who say, well, this is a good idea to have a workplace development in developing countries, uh, to have them uh, take over responsibility for their own uh, environment. And uh, we are willing to give uh, the parts away uh, at costs, and it's their part uh, to uh, assemble them, to distribute them, uh, to bring Braille uh, to the less developed countries. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, hi, hi, Wolfgang. Hi. Uh, very interesting, very innovative. My question is, so in the age of, you know, the, the technology we have today, and we saw Eric's vision, what's the role of uh, Braille? Uh, in the age of, uh, of, of using audio uh, as a main interface uh, as I mean like conveying information uh, through writing uh, as yep. opposed to conveying information as is as a speech. Well, uh, in all pitches, uh, this question pops up. And uh, you see, uh, I'm prepared to answer this. Uh, this is the statistics from the United States. And uh, sorry, so something doesn't work with, uh, with uh, uh, displaying here. Uh, so I have to fall back on my, my written notes. So uh, in this diagram, uh, you have in green, the job uh, opportunities or the job chances for literate people in green and for illiterate people, pre illiterate people uh, in red. So only 10% of people just relying on hearing and speaking and audio technologies have uh, have jobs in the United States. 90% of the jobs uh, are covered by people who have learned to read and to write in Braille. So it's important for jobs, it's important for learning, and certainly important for every day. I agree with you that for things like uh, reading a book, uh, you can he uh, listen to an audio book. Uh, but you would, for example, never uh, have your, your emails or your SMSs read in the public transport by audio where all people could could listen and situations like this or if you are a speaker in a conference you cannot uh, work without your manuscript and reading reading your part so working in radio and in press there yeah, it's certainly necessary uh, to be able to read and to write and you to have the proper tools at hand so, so uh, by my understanding, maybe it's wrong, it it's, would be good to view uh, this pie chart uh, over time because it's kind of a closed loop, uh, meaning you need to, there are many Braille related solutions, so you need to know Braille. But over time, as there's less and less uh, reliance on Braille to convey information, you know, maybe literacy in terms of speech to text, kind of voice-based communication uh can, th that's just my understanding so so there's kind of a d delay or lag in many 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 areas uh including that but we'll, we'll have to see in let's say 20 years yeah. thank you adi thank you wolfgang thank you everyone all the 10 contestants uh Sorry for overrunning. I think it was a good sign that we had a very, very interesting session with all kinds of, you know, accessibility, digital health, and a lot of uh, that actually touching both. And please, judges, uh, move to the Zoom session that I've sent you earlier the, with the, the inviting email, and we're going to discuss the result. And the contestants, don't worry, you wouldn't be here left alone. Uh, we have actually my manager here on the call as well, Yen. 
and she is going to answer the question, especially for you, Wolfgang. You said you don't know about OPPO, and this is the perfect opportunity uh, for us to introduce a little bit what OPPO is about and what we do here at our team. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I think you can hear me. So yes, I will share. Perfectly. Great. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, yes we can. Okay, uh, I, I'm so excited to see uh, this amazing solutions uh, from all over the Europe, especially Tech for Good or what we call in OPPO Virtuous Innovation. And personally, I am a strong believer of social entrepreneurship. I believe we can create social value at the same time of commercial value. So uh, I would like to, I hate to stay between you and your beer or your dinner with the family, but the judge need a little bit time to align on the winners and before they go and announce the winners today, I would spend a few minutes sharing with you who is OPPO and our open innovation team here in Europe and what we want to achieve. So my name is Yan. Uh, I lead the open innovation activity for OPPO in Europe. So who is OPPO? So OPPO is actually one of the largest smartphone vendors globally. We are uh, number four with 11% market share. Globally, we have 500 million users. What I want to emphasize here is also among the top five vendors, OPPO has the highest growing growth rate. And we are operating in more than 60 countries with more than 40,000 employees. So the vision of the company is strive to be a sustainable company which contribute to a better world. That's why one of the reasons why we are having this inspiration challenge together with a startup globally. And we are very strong in Asia. If you look at country like China, India, Southeast Asia, we are uh, mostly top three there. And our growth region is from Europe. If you are in Paris earlier this month, you will see us in the French Open. And also we were at VivaTech earlier and we, we become official sponsor of VivaTech as well as Wimbledon since 2019, uh, given our strong growth in Europe. Also, we were friends with FC Barcelona since 2015 uh, for quite a long time. We have an interesting joint branding with Lamborghini. So if you need a, a phone to match with your Lamborghini, this OPPO phone is for you. With the strong growth in, Asia, in Europe, we also built up a design center in London to tailor to the European consumer needs. A little bit about OPPO R&D, because this whole acceleration program is all organized by OPPO R&D. Actually, OPPO as a company invests heavily in R&D. And with our strong investment, we actually now, according to WePo, the World IP Organization, we rank top six in all the com companies in terms of IP application grants. So we are very proud to be the youngest company among the top 10 list. So this list is not just phone companies or telecom companies, but all type of tech companies. And in China, we are top three in terms of IP. So with the investment, we also deliver some amazing um, innovations to, to our consumers, 500 million consumers globally. As here, you can see a few examples. The first one is our air glass. Actually, we have uh, released this, uh, in have a soft launch in China recently. And we also demonstrate this technology in FC Barcelona earlier this year in Europe, as well as in US in the AWE event. And at the same time in the middle, you can see the OPPO MPU. This is a OPPO in-house developed uh, chip. And this is already in our OPPO phone series. And the right hand side, you can see the OPPO Superwalk fast charging technology. 
Oppo has been one of the leading uh, vendors in terms of charging technology. We are not only using the technology in-house, we are already licensing this technology to our partners in the ecosystem, such as automotive IoT vendors, where they can deliver this uh, better charging experience to our consumer. So in addition to all this, we also have our Oppo Find and the foldable phone series when the most innovative hardware uh, in the Mobile World Conference earlier in Barcelona. So what are we trying to do here in o the Oppo Innovation team here in Israel and Europe? So we are the bridge between the startups in Europe and the headquarter. We are working here to scout for the innovation technology to evaluate as well as to drive the partnership and investment. And actually, before the company set up the office, we already have strategic investment as well as partnership in the region. And why does the company want to set up the physical office here is to is for the long term presence as well as the time zone difference. You can always find your con your partner and your contact in the region to talk with if you need partnership with Oppo or if you need some support to push forward the partnership. So is it an easy job? Uh, I think we have many experts on startup partner, corporate partnership here in the audience. Uh, we know it's not easy. There are so many challenges along the way. I'm not saying startup are from Mars and corporate are from another planet, but there are indeed a lot of challenges. After many years of working in this startup corporate world, when people ask me, what is your view? I said, I'm a, I'm a realistic optimism. So why am I why am I realistic? Because there are so many challenges in different way of working, different level of risk tolerance, uh, different like especially also the cultural difference. And a lot of startup is a niche champion. Well, a lot of times the corporate are looking for total solution. So even despite of all the challenges, why am I still an optimist? The reason is because. I can see strongly with the power, with the R&D strengths and the global network and resources of Opal, the ability of us to empower and augment the value of startups and bring the innovation from Israel and Europe to our consumers in Asia and globally. I'm also very optimistic because even though we are a very sizable company already, we are still very young. We are just turning 18 years old. I know 18 doesn't sound very young in a startup world, but 18 is quite young for a big corporate. So we are still young and hungry, and we are a corporate with entrepreneurship spirit. Uh, another reason I'm optimistic is also because of our team. Actually, we believe people are most important into in bridging the conversation. That's why we have built up a team with diverse background, with knowledge into the R&D, in startup as well as the corporate, with knowledge in investment as well as tech commercialization, with the background in the European side of the ecosystem as well as Asia Pacific side of ecosystem. I believe strongly with the strong team we are building here, we are able to bridge uh, the startups with our headquarter and build more win-win partnerships. And the key message I want to deliver here is uh, this is this whole task of uh, bridging the digital gap of making technology more accessible is not a small task in China. In China or Chinese, we have this old saying, uh, if we work together, we can move the mountain. And I believe bridging the digital gap is a huge mountain Oppo couldn't do alone. And I look forward to work with every one of you here to make the technology more accessible to the consumers globally. And with that, I stop my sharing. We wait for the judge. So while we are waiting, I want to like share one thing I learned in the, we, earlier last week, we have a show show here in Israel. I learned a new sign language. So it's a Israeli, it's a sign language. So it's like this technology more accessible. 
So that's the key message I want to leave with you guys is let's work together to make your technology more accessible. Let's bring the innovation in digital health and accessibility to our consumers globally. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure our judge are back. Let me check. Anyone have any questions? Is there an accessible technology you're most uh, passionate about over the next five years? I'm most passionate about uh, elderly tech, uh, how to make uh, the elderly live a better life. I give you example, like there are like in during the COVID, uh, a lot of technology moved to the phone or the internet. But in Europe, actually, uh, according to a latest survey, uh, I think in 2020, only 11% of the internet user is uh, is uh, fall in the age group of eight, 65 and plus. So uh, the, the, they don't know how to book uh, they could book a appointment with the doctor on, on the phone or on the computer. They don't know how to buy their grocery on their phone and how can they live a life during this uh, time. So I believe the COVID actually accelerates the needs to close, close this age-based digital divide. That's why this is the area I think we should all work together to bring more value. Actually, OPPO have uh, quite a lot of solution in this area. Uh, we have uh, developed, of course, on the phone, we have a simple mode, and we also have a special supporting function where the elderly can call their uh, children to support them on some functionality. We also deliver a tra physical training workshop, leveraging our global retail network and do doing physical training to elderly on how to use smart devices to access to different services. And we are building some R&D into software on this area as well. So I, I really hope we as a corporate can work with more startups to make this specific group. I think we are also getting older. I believe when we get older, it's also the robotics and everything needed to help us live a better life and also the digital health solutions. So this is the area I, uh, I personally am very passionate about. May I ask if uh, the goal of OPPO is also to build more software, to get more into the software field, like getting somewhere in the direction of Google or Apple, building a whole ecosystem, or should it stay with smartphones and the uh, smartphone OS systems? Uh, I believe the, uh, actually I didn't include this part into the introduction. Uh, but OPPO in addition, because we believe the hardware is the enabler. So in addition to our uh, strong portfolio of phones, IOTs, we also have a, a huge portfolio of software services to our consumer. So our operating system, Color OS, actually uh, have a robust developer ecosystem, uh, but more in Asia Pacific. So uh, I would say, uh, Hardware, software, and services is part of the strategic direction we are going. And we are also putting a lot of R&D, for example, in the area of edge AI, uh, where because uh, everything is moving to the edge or on device. So there is a lot of expertise actually uh, putting into this direction. Thank you for the question. That's a good one, because uh, most people will see us as a hardware vendor. But so is your focus also to extend then from the Asian market to Europe and America? I mean, you do have it with OnePlus. I guess uh, more, more European focus. Yeah, like, Europe is our one of our uh, strong focus area. As I shared earlier, uh, we invest heavily in the region 
and we definitely uh, look forward to have uh, more exposure in the region with our innovation as well as our partnership uh, in Europe. We actually have uh, some strategic partnership with one, some of the largest telcos and they would love to see our AR and new innovation bring some uh, new faces into their store, into their uh, consumer. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the AR. Do you already know when it might come to the rest of the world? About the product launch, I couldn't comment, but we already demonstrated it in Europe and US and of course across the world. I, uh, we actually have a, a development and R&D of this uh, direction for quite a while. This is already the, uh, I think, third, fourth iteration of the product. Uh, so I look forward to see it in the market here. And then there should also be some software ecosystem, some metaverse around it. If you, or just like for the beginning, having it just as an simple AR headset, just for navigation, uh, everything. We believe you couldn't uh, just sell, like the hardware couldn't do alone. Uh, as from our angle, the biggest barrier for uh, AR adaption, of course, it comes uh, in the hardware side. There is a lot of technology is not solved yet in the industry. Uh, to have a comfortable to use uh, a hardware. We are, we and a lot of the industry is working on this. Uh, however, the killer app or the user experience is something also very important for mass market adoption. So uh, for example, we are working with the uh, one, uh, this is in PR so I can share. We are working with a few of the largest e-commerce companies and the gaming companies as well as some of the developers to bring more service, bring more uh, experience to the AR. So we do believe it need to go hand in hand, the hardware and the, the content and services and the software. You cannot uh, do hardware alone on this. That's nice. I'm very curious to see what will come. Yeah, it's an exciting time because we believe the, uh, not the, not just us, but the industry analysts also believe Asia Pacific will be the first region for, for XR to take off. The Asia Pacific region is quite in, aggressive in adopting new technology, uh, especially digital health. That's why we are very excited also to see some of digital health solution uh, with potential to implement in Asia. That's good, as uh, we are moving in two weeks to uh, South Korea to oh, enter nice. the market. Yeah, this uh, Asia Pacific, even the elderly, uh, the dig digital adoption rate is uh, quite high for them. Do you have developments in like robotics? For future uh, directions, I couldn't comment. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Hello, everyone. I'm back. Sorry for the long wait. As you could tell, that we have uh, uh, judges that we're really, you know, uh, committed and engaged the events, so we had some very interesting discussions. So bad I couldn't tell you all, but uh, I think it was agreed, uh, you know, in the judge panel by all four judges that it was a amazing session. Uh, we had very very high quality, um, also the pitches and also the technology themselves. I think it was really really the top tier, and uh, we couldn't be happier to have you here on the call. Um, Having said that, of course, this is a competition and there's only always going to be winners uh, and it's not going to be 10. <laughs> we have four winners tonight and I'm going to announce uh, according to the scoring of the judges. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay with us after the event. We're going to be online for a few more minutes to answer all your questions uh, or you can call up the day and try to connect with us you know, on other times. Uh, you have us, we have our partners at Hello Tomorrow. 
uh, and you have other judges as mentioned, you're always welcome to find them on LinkedIn and talk to them to propose for other stuff as well. Uh, so, drum roll, the winner of today's uh, OPPO Acceleration Program on Digital Health and Accessibility for the online phase for Europe, <laughs> the winners are Sinterect, ARX Vision, Albert Hell, last but not least, Idun Technologies. Sorry, I should have some kind of like you know, music effect. Uh, I don't know, like uh, some effect you're playing, but uh, I, I would just uh, assume that everyone's clapping. Uh, very, very happy to the four winners, and thank you all for everyone here to be on the call. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to be staying on the live for a few more minutes in case you have any questions. And also, you know, if one of you, the winners, want to understand what's going to happen for the next steps, uh, we are going to have this, you know, formal communication early next week. But if you want to ask anything just in person, I'm going to be here as well. Again, thank you very much for our speakers today. Thank you, Yen, very much for your nice speech. Uh, thank you, our friends, Vincent, Alba. Thank you, all the judges. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, my team, Adi and Yindi. Uh, didn't have a camera on. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. And it was really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It was an amazing event. Thank you. It was really nice to have you too. We're very happy to have the people here on the call. I was mm -hmm. worried that people were not going to do good pitches, but I guess it was, you know, overthinking. <laughs> no, it's always wonderful to share the story. Uh, great, then we'll be in touch. Till next time. Yes, thank you a lot, and uh, we will be in touch soon. <laughs> it's not going to be in the distant future, so thank you. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Alba. Okay, thanks, thanks Alba. You. I guess that's uh, everything, that's everyone, and I'll be waiting for the playback. Exactly. Uh, you didn't have the opportunity to meet Yen, and she is the manager here. Uh, Hi, John. It's a pleasure to meet you, and thanks for joining and entertaining the audience in the, in the <laughs> meantime. <laughs> yes, that's everything. Yeah, no problem, you, Alba, as my computer stuck. Oh, okay. Bye -bye. I, thought, uh, no I saw she stayed here for, for us. Okay, never mind. Thank you, Alba. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I didn't see Vincent, so I assume that uh, he's, uh, you know, busy parenting. Yeah, he had to uh, left, but exactly. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I'm finishing the event you. right now. No, I thank you pleasure. a lot. Yes, and uh, send me the playback once you have it. And I think we are ninety nine percent done with. Perfect. With everything here, great. Bye. Bye. Have a great night. <laughs>